Hi everybody, my name is Geneviève Tardif and welcome to my podcast El Bré. But today it's more Day Shine. I am doing my first English interview and we are talking soccer with the goalkeeper Stéphanie Labbé, who has been part of the Canadian Women's Soccer Program since 2002. She made her Olympic debut at Rio 2016, where she started five of six games, allowing just four goals as Team Canada won the bronze medal. Labbé was on the Canadian roster for the FIFA Women's World Cup in 2011 and 2015 and helped Canada qualify for the 2019 FIFA Women's World Cup with their silver medal at the 2018 CONCACAF Championship. And now <laughs> I am reading because she has a, a great, great introduction. She did so much stuff. Hi, Stephanie. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for that. <laughs> 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 well, I'm really happy to talk to you. And the, the first thing I was surprised, it's your name, Stéphanie Labbé, and you don't speak French. Where are you from? I know, I know. I get this all the time and <laughs> I feel like I'm like putting a bad name to my family. <laughs> <laughs> um, my dad, he's uh, his whole side of the family is French. So my dad is first language French. Um, he grew up in a French community in Edmonton. Um, but you know, he, he married my mom who is English speaking and, um, I guess the, the French tradition kind of ended there. Um, he loves, you know, when I have French teammates around or when he reconnects with his old friends from school and whatnot, and he can, um, keep using his French, but yeah, the, him and all of his siblings, they, they all married English speaking people. So, um, <laughs> I think the, the French stopped there, unfortunately for them. So you're born in Edmonton? Yes. Okay. And uh, how have you discovered soccer? Yeah. Um, I grew up being a like major multi-sport athlete. You know, I wanted to just be active and play sports and it really started out as a social thing for me. I just wanted to be around people, be around my friends Um, so I really like, you know, it didn't matter what I asked my parents to do. They, they registered me and it allowed me to try every sport and, um, play competitively in, in many different sports. And, um, I just, when I started playing soccer, um, I just really enjoyed the, the challenge of it. I loved running around. Um, and when I first became a goalkeeper, I think there was just this like, yeah, exciting thrill of having so much pressure on you, um, And yeah, just the challenge of like wanting to get better and being able to, it was kind of unique for me being an individual athlete in a team sport. And I think I really like thrived in that. Um, there's a part of me that I think I could be a successful individual athlete because I am so self-motivated and I have so much mm -hmm. like inner fire in me and I, I can easily like train alone. I can go to the gym on my own. I can train in my basement. Um, I really have that inside me. So I like have those qualities, which I think helped me as a goalkeeper. Um, but then I really thrive being around people and being in a group setting and um, being able to find motivation and inspiration from others around me as well as give it. So I think there was just so much encompassing in the sport of soccer that really drew me towards it. You said that you tried a lot of sports when you were younger. What uh, sports have you tried? Yes. So I grew up playing hockey mostly. That was kind of my main one. I had an older brother Ooh. who was a hockey player and um, really just wanted to be just like him, wanted to follow in his <laughs> in his footsteps or in his in his skates, I should say. <laughs> um, so, yeah, hockey was kind of the main one. But then, you know, in school, I play, I did like track and field, volleyball, badminton, basketball, um, really like anything you you can name I I tried it out and I loved it and um, even through high school I, I tried out for all the teams and played some high school sports and um, yeah I've just kind of always been an advocate of that even now as a once like now that I'm a professional um, I still believe in cross training in the off season and doing mm -hmm. different sports because um, I really see myself as a professional athlete not just a professional soccer player and Um, I think just being well-rounded as an athlete and being adaptable and um, being able to challenge your body in new ways, I think it can only make you a better athlete. You have a lot of great achievements in your career already, and your career is not done. Uh, what's the one that you're the most proud of? Yeah, there's there's a few that come to mind. Um, first and foremost, for sure, um, 2016, winning the Olympic bronze medal yeah. um, with the national team. That was a, a huge moment, um, you know, for us as a team to 
to go and win back-to-back um, medals, um, one of the first team sports to do so in, in many, many years. Um, so I think that for sure is one of the first things that come to mind. And then um, two years ago in 2019, I finally won my first um, professional championship um, with the North Carolina Courage. And that mm-hmm. was that was really special to me. You know, I know a lot of players don't even get to achieve one at all in their career, but for me to, to be in that position to, to win a championship with that team, um, you know, as an older player nearing towards the latter part of my career, um, it was a really, really special moment for me. It's something I've really worked towards. And um, I, yeah, I just really feel like things were coming together for me that year. And um, I was really uh, grateful to be a part of that team and that program. Have you ever dreamed when you were younger to be at the Olympics? You know what? I like, I remember growing up and, and watching the Olympics, but, um, I think I always like had this dream of wanting to be there, but it wasn't clear in the sense of like what sport I wanted to do. (laughs) Um, you know, watching it, I didn't grow up watching soccer. Canada wasn't in the Olympics until 2008. So, and which I was an alternate on that team. So, you know, I didn't grow up watching, um, the Olympics and really dreaming that in that sense. But, you know, I remember watching, Donovan Bailey and Haley yeah. Wickenheiser and, you know, some, some really inspirational Canadians. And so I think there was this like fire and passion inside me that loved the Olympics and wanted to be there. I think I just couldn't picture like where I fit into that in a sense. Um, so I think the dream was always there. And I think the more and more that I started to excel at soccer and move up the rankings and, and then started to kind of see that, you know, this could take me there. I think that's when the dream kind of evolved over time. And I started to really see myself in that position. We talk about your achievements and your success, uh, but let's talk about the most difficult time for you during your career or as a person, what's the most difficult time for you? Yeah, I've kind of gone through, like, I see my career, so many ups and downs. Um, and, you know, there's been a lot of really amazing things that I've been able to accomplish, but, you know, they don't come without the the lows. And I think having the lows um, makes those highs so much more, um, you're so much more grateful for them, appreciative. Um, you really feel the emotion of them so much more uh, because you know where you, where you've come from and you know, at the same time, it it makes the lows feel that much lower and that much harder (laughs) because you know where you can be or where you have been. Um, So for sure, like after the 2016 Olympics, I went into a pretty low, dark space um, where, you know, I felt all this success and I felt like I had been working for so many years towards this um, amazing pinnacle of, of sport and to be able to achieve something so amazing. And, you know, I remember standing on the podium and feeling just so emotional because of how much I had put into that moment. And I think it's like everything coming to that peak in that moment. And then when that moment's over and kind of that, like that rush wears off, um, you're kind of just left with yourself. And it's, it's that feeling of like, well, what now? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, you've, you feel like you've achieved something so monumental and so great and you've worked for so many years for it. And number one, I think at that moment, the thought of like, doing all that work again is, um, like kind of scary and overwhelming. And then at the same time, like just wondering how you could top that emotion. Cause I think as athletes, we're constantly striving for more. We're constantly striving to like be better and better and better. Mm-hmm. And then when you feel like you've, you know, hit this point of like, you feel like you've maxed out, then it's like, okay, well, I still want more. I still want to be better. And it's that constant drive is, um, it's fatiguing and it's challenging and, Um, I think that really caught up to me after the Olympics and um, went into a pretty, yeah, dark place um, mentally and emotionally. And um, yeah, I'd say that's probably one of the biggest challenges. And it's definitely kind of come and gone since then. I think that's when I really hit the peak of it. Um, But there's been different environments and different challenging times that have kind of brought it out in me. And I think the more that I've like been through those dark times, the more I've figured out Number one, like what my triggers are and what types of things tend to set me off into the spirals, into the dark places. But at the same time, I've really found what my tools are for coping and my coping mechanisms and um, how to really get myself out of those dark places so I don't stay there for too long. Um, But that's definitely been a challenge for me is to, um, yeah, I guess, battle the the moments of depression and anxiety and panic and 
um, all of those things. Did you go uh, see a psychologist or or someone that you could help you? Um, at the time in 2016, I did not reach out. Um, I was really leaning on my support system and my um, friends and family around me. Um, but more recently, like in the past two years, I have been working much closer with a sports psychologist. And um, I think for me, that was something that I really realized I need. I'm, I love to talk and I love to get <laughs> my emotions out. Um, I've really realized um, that the more I hold them in, um, the more detrimental that is to me. So the more I started talking, the more I realized how healing and helping that is for me. Um, <laughs> so I've yeah surrounded myself with now my sports psychologist who I connect with almost weekly um, just to kind of keep on top of it and keep myself in check and um, really give myself that unbiased, um, non-judgmental resource that I know I can be completely open and honest with. And um, I know that she, um, yeah, well, has, has the tools to help me bring myself back to um, where I need to be. You are openly gay. And uh, congratulations, by the way, you are proud of it and showing it. And I love it. It's really, really cool. <laughs> But in Rio, there was some homophobic slurs that you heard playing soccer. Um, do you remember it? Yeah, I uh, briefly. I mean, I remember like being on the field and going out for warm up, um, you know, when it, it is a little bit quieter. And as a goalkeeper, you know, you're warming up in the goal and the fans are all right behind the goal screaming. And um, I think in one sense, you know, it, I didn't necessarily hear a lot that it was in English, but I knew what the... Um, mm -hmm. Portuguese slangs were um, okay. so yes I heard it um, but I think I was just so in the moment and um, so present in what I was doing that I was able to tune it out and um, really not really focus on it um, but I do remember it being there and I, I remember it kind of making me think and you know making me second guess some things but I think at the end of the day I just am so confident and sure in myself that Um, I'm able to like tune those things out and, and not let it affect me personally. You said second guess some things. What are the things that you second guess? Yeah, I think it's just like, you know, I feel so lucky to be in the soccer world where um, the LGBTQ community is so well supported and um, yeah. it's such a safe space. Um, so I think, you know, when you go into environment, you feel so safe that you really let your guard down. Um, and I feel so confident being myself. And I know that's the soccer space has really created that for me. Um, but then, you know, you go into these other environments and um, it, it makes you second guess, I guess, what's around you and that, you know, you're not supported by everybody. Um, I think sometimes I feel like I'm in a bubble where, you know, I don't feel that negativity and I forget that there's people out there that have different opinions and different um, values than that. So um, I think it just kind of, makes you, um, yeah, second guess, like your thoughts on the, the people around you and you just kind of, um, yeah, just like made me remember again that the world isn't a, a fully loving place and there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, absolutely. And do you think it, it has changed since then? I mean, I think so. And I hope so. I hope that, you know, in, in four years that we've made improvements as a global society, um, But I know there is still a lot of work to be done and maybe it's not in, in terms of um, just with uh, gays, but I know like obviously there's a lot um, right now in terms of the transgender community and um, showing the support and creating safe spaces for mm -hmm. them right now. Um, so I know that, you know, it's, it's evolving and changing and I think the more that people are speaking out and, um, you know, showing themselves as who they are. I think the more that we're going to create conversations and create safer spaces, because, um, you know, it, it takes some people with courage, unfortunately, you know, to come out and start talking. And then I think it opens all of our eyes. I know for me, I've learned a lot this year from my national teammate, Quinn, who's come out as um, trans. And um, I've, you know, asked those questions because I didn't know everything. And I think it's more, about having the conversations and, and being vulnerable and asking the questions that maybe you're scared to ask. And um, I think the more that we ask, the more that we learn and the more that we can all create safe spaces for everybody around us. Yeah. And I heard that uh, the most difficult thing for transgender, but also uh, I would say gay people is the way parents are helping their children in accepting the way they are. Um, 
and it's really important for for parents to to understand too how was your parents with you for sure yeah and i think it's just language um it's understanding that you know we grew up a certain way and we grew up with certain language and i think it's important to understand that you know whether it's with pronouns or whether it's how we address a group um you know something so simple that i've learned um is you know even though you're on uh a uh, women's team to not address the team as like hey ladies or what's up girls huh. um because maybe that doesn't include everybody that's in the group and so i think it's just little things like that i know it's it's things that you don't always think about but um you know just having conversations you start to understand those types of things that that is hurtful to some people and um as much as it is you know something innocent coming out of your mouth it's um important to have those conversations and i think the earlier we can do it with kids the earlier we can expose them and have these conversations um kids are so innocent they they um you know they learn from the people around them and if the people around them are instilling these open um supporting loving uh language around them then i think that they're going to grow up having that same support and love for the people around them let's talk now about covid <laughs> the <laughs> olympic are now in 2021 next year how did you react when that happened Yeah, it's definitely been a, a range of emotions with it. Um, the initial, you know, when Canada first made their decision to um, pull out of the Olympics as one of the first countries to do so, I think that was definitely really challenging for me um, because I was really scared that, you know, are these Olympics going to go on and we're not going to be there? Um, and I think, you know, the thought of how much work we've put in, um, that we had just qualified, so we were coming off of a high of qualifying for the Olympics, Um And then, oh man, the Olympics are going to go on, but Canada's not going to set any athletes. So that was really challenging. And then, you know, obviously followed by the Olympics being postponed. I think there was just this thought of um, you feel so close and you feel like you're putting in the final preparations to all, all of a sudden you're a year out and you're no longer putting in the final preparations. Now you're almost like looking back or taking a step back and looking at, okay, well now what can we do in a whole year? And it's like that weird thing of thinking we have so much time, but yet as like a soccer team, you know, when there's um, 25 of you scattered around the world at different professional leagues, like we actually don't have a lot of time because we can't come together because of COVID. So it was kind of this weird balance of um, being excited that, oh, there's another year for us to continue to improve and to get us even further along our um, pathway of where we want to be. But yeah, like I said, at the same time, it was almost impossible for us to get together as a team to actually make those improvements. So I think there was this kind of juxtaposition of it that was really challenging to um, navigate. But I think there's been a lot of highs and lows. It's really gone up and down. You know, you get your hopes up, you think things are getting better, and then your hopes <laughs> kind of get crushed down. So it was really about trying to maintain a like an even level of emotion and, and mindset and um I think really listening to my body, listening to my mind of what I wanted, what I needed, um, knowing that I didn't need, I wasn't pushing for that final 1% anymore. Um, I had the time, so it was about pushing, but then listening to my body of when it needed a break and my mind when it needed a break and then pushing again when I felt good again. And um, I think it's just been a lot of like, yeah, listening to myself and, and figuring out what I need and what um, what I really can achieve in this time and what did you do during that time have you trained in your house uh, what did you do yes yes I was doing a lot of training in my house I actually picked up um indoor cycling which was like really crazy to me but you know having uh, Zwift yes I've been Zwifting <laughs> <laughs> so of course um my partner Georgia Simmerling is an Olympic track cyclist so You know, we have like six bikes laying around in our basement, all, you know, a couple of them connected to trainers and um, <laughs> got myself set up on Zwift and started uh, entering in races. There was a group of us um, that were all doing it. Myself, Georgia, Brady Lehman, Chris Robanski, uh, Phil Brown. So there's a good group of us uh, Olympians that were all meeting up every Tuesday night and doing the same race uh, at the same time every night, every Tuesday. And Um, we had a little group going on and I think that was fun to cool. um, not only, you know, continue to stay fit and stay strong, but at the same time, kind of bring that competitive edge and um, bring out that excitement of, of racing and, you know, wanting to beat someone. And um, that was a really fun addition to COVID that, you know, I wasn't expecting. And um, yeah, I think that was like a big thing. And then for sure, like working out in my basement, we've, we have a pretty good gym set up, which 
I'm very grateful for. Um, and then I was like in and out with my professional team. I went down to North Carolina. We had a tournament down there or a tournament in Utah for the league. Um, then we had a couple of games this fall as well. So um, I was really fortunate that our sport was able to find a way to, to get games in and um, do so very successfully. Um, and then, yeah, now I'm back home and back in the, the basement grind. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I see you climbing mountains and everything on Instagram. So. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm doing my best. I've been getting outside and exploring nature. I'm a big advocate of like being in the mountains. That is my absolute happy place. I just feel like all my stress and worries go away when I'm in the mountains. Um, so being here in Calgary is, uh, I'm very fortunate for that. And I try to get out there as much as I possibly can. Yeah, to go hiking, go skating, um, just really enjoy um, this time because I don't normally get to be home for this long. So I think it's really important to, to enjoy this time with my family, with my partner, and um, for sure, you know, enjoying Canada's beautiful um, landscapes here. Oh, yes. You played in the men's soccer team in Calgary. What's the name of the soccer team? Yes. Uh, at the time, they were the Calgary Foothills. Okay. Yes. Okay. And now there, there's another name? Uh, yes. Well, the team has kind of evolved. I mean, the Foothills still are there, but the team that I was actually with has evolved into the Cavalry FC, which is in the new uh, men's, the CPL, the Canadian Premier League. Okay. And how was it? It was uh, a really, really amazing experience. Um, I was so welcomed by the players, by the coaches, by the staff, um, really by the whole like club and board. And um, they were all so welcoming and really treated me just as one of them. Um, they didn't see me as a girl trying to train out, try out for the team. They really just saw me as another player. And that I will always be grateful for, um, you know, the fact that Even still now, I, I'm training with the goalkeepers. Um, we still train together every time I'm home. And the coach has kind of offered, you know, an open invitation for me to come out and train with them. Anytime I'm home, I'm always welcome to come out. And I think that really shows uh, how forward thinking they are and how supportive they were of me um, trying to kind of break the mold here. And um, unfortunately, you know, the league didn't have the same vision and the league didn't have the same openness and, and views of it. Um, and they were the ones who ultimately shut it down, which was really disappointing. Um, but uh, I think overall, like it was a really great experience. And um, I'm really grateful for the Calgary Foothills organization for giving me that opportunity and um, continuing to do so now. But why they decided to shut it down? Uh, the, the league's opinion was that this was a gender based league and that it was for men only. That was their pretty strong stance and um you know we tried to tried to prove that um I was being judged based on talent and it wasn't based on gender and that I had proved my worth and um they unfortunately were pretty um strong in their stance but yeah even if uh, it did not work mm -hmm. do you think that it helped young girls to push forward I hope so I mean I hope that every Um, young, you know, boy or girl has, has big dreams and um, really feels that, you know, no matter what their dreams are, that if they work hard, they can achieve it and that they won't be judged or they won't be, their dream won't be taken away from them strictly because of something that, you know, how they were born and your gender is, you know, you're born that way. And it's, it's difficult to change, you know, it's not like, Of course, you know, if you're in a position like we were talking earlier about transgender and um, and their experiences, but I think it's it's just this idea that um, we're being judged on something that we don't have control over. And, um, you know, I was born a female and, and that's not going to change. And I don't want my dreams to be stopped because of something that I can't control. And um, I think that that's something where we can continue to evolve and, and grow and Um, that I think was the hardest part of it, but I, yeah, I really hope that, you know, some have taken my story and, um, really used it as motivation to continue to push and push the envelope, push the boundaries and, um, have big dreams. And I think the more that we can support young, um, young kids to, to dream big and, and not have any limitations on those dreams, um, the more that we're going to see amazing success stories. Yeah. And you're not alone. There's the U.S. women's soccer team that, You know, they fight for equity. Uh, what do you think mm -hmm. about that? 
uh, I think it's amazing. They they have the platform to do so. They have the results to back themselves up. And I think what they're doing, not only for themselves and not only for women in um, the U.S., but all around the world, you know, they are leading the the, the charge. And um, there's so many women's teams out there that have followed their lead and are um, achieving amazing equality contracts with within their countries. And um, I only hope that you know, the rest of the world can can follow suit and we can continue to, to push that boundary. And there's the Angel City team, that is the Los Angeles soccer team in the National Women Soccer League. And they have uh, high profile investors, including uh, Hollywood actresses like Natalie Portman, Eva Longoria, Serena William, Jessica Chastain. It's really cool, no? Yes, it is. They are definitely leaving a legacy on, you know, what sports should be about. And um, they're really, you know, wanting to to build up this team. And I think it's amazing to have these investors and support behind this team. And I think they're really kind of setting the stage and setting the um, the standard for what this league should be and what women's sports should be. And um, I think it's really exciting to see what's going to follow through with that team and um, what the future looks like because the the present looks really amazing. And I think, like I said, they're just setting the standard and, and really pushing the the levels of what all the other teams um, need to continue to do to keep pushing forward. And um, hopefully, you know, one day all of the teams and all of the, the league can be at that standard. Yeah, because I read that you reacted on Twitter about a man who asked if you could invest in one sport league or team, who would it be? And how have you reacted? What did you say? Yeah, I think I said the first thing that came to mind was the fact that we don't have any women's professional teams of any sport in in Canada. And I know, of course, we have the the one women's hockey team that is starting up this year or mm -hmm. next year. Um, but, you know, I think about how many world class teams and athletes we have in Canada, um, you know, soccer, basketball, rugby, um, just to name a few. Uh, hockey, of course, and to think that we don't have any professional teams in this country for females, it's it's mind blowing. And I think it's, um, you know, as Canadians, we're always very proud of our country and proud of that. But that's something that, you know, I'm not proud of. I'm not proud of our lack of investment in women's sport in this country. And I'm not proud <laughs> of the lack of support for for female athletes. And I think if we want to continue to push the boundaries and push our status in the world and um, keep bringing home, you know, world championship, world cup and Olympic medals um, to this country, then I think there needs to be a conversation about this and there needs to be a push in, in the investment. And um, it has to be a selfless investment. We, you know, it's not going to, you know, come back. The money may not come back in the first one, two, three years, but in the long term, it's one of the best investments that you can make. Um, and I just like, I'm so disappointed that we don't have that in Canada yet and that it's 2020, almost 2021. And um, I really hope that, um, you know, there is a spark and there is a change because um, we're going to start to fall behind in, in the world rankings if we don't start to invest and, and keep our athletes home here in Canada. Uh, what's your dream, Stephanie? What, what's your goal for for you and for your career? Yeah, I really want to invest and give um, young athletes the platform and the opportunity to um, train and build towards their potential. Um, so I want to help foster those dreams and help foster that that training for young athletes. Um, and, you know, I would love to, one of my big visions is to build a facility that really fosters that and give young athletes the a place to play where they can train like a professional and train like an elite athlete and um, really have their dreams be built there and, um, you know, foster them in all areas, whether it's, you know, on the the field, the court, the ice, whatever it is, and also off in terms of nutrition, psychology, um, recovery, all of those types of things. So I think, um, yeah, I really want to help build and inspire dreams in young athletes. Stephanie, thank you so much. I will look for you on Zwift. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and just uh, keep going and uh, good luck for Tokyo in 2021. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. What a great interview with Stephanie Labbé. So interesting, so inspiring. It was my first English interview, but not the last, that's for sure. And the next one will be at Christmas.
Christmas. It will be a great gift because this woman is just awesome. She's making me smile every time I talk to her and she's a skateboarder. She's just a badass. <laughs> See you at Christmas. Bye.